Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think we'll start fairly promptly. We're delighted to have Dr. Garda Kami with us. Uh, I've spent the weekend reading her fantastic book, and you're going to have this wonderful opportunity, of course, to buy a copy yourself and have it signed by her at the back. I just need to say that this whole event is, is being filmed live, all of it. So if any of you don't really want to be on the camera, please move over to those red seats over there if you don't want to be picked up on the camera. Um, I have to mention that. Uh, the idea really is that I have a chat with Gaba for about 20 minutes, half an hour, and then we open it all up to you. Um, because uh, I I'd sat down with one state, the only democratic future for Palestine, Israel, over the weekend, and almost in one sitting, um, I read it. It's a fantastic book. Uh, very cogently written, very powerful arguments. Um, also, just for, for people who may not be as familiar as, as, as many of us, perhaps, about history, it's a very educative uh, piece of work. It really does set things out very, very clearly. And I will you know, begin, actually, by asking Garda about her own story, because I think that's going to be very interesting for people, of, people amongst you who don't know her. Um, so I should start really by thanking all of you who attended the last event uh, that Palestine Deep Dive did. This event is being hosted by Palestine Deep Dive. We're doing this in concert with Pluto Press, delighted to be working with Pluto um, and encouraging people to uh, pick up the book and buy it. So um, the event last uh, month against erasure, why Palestinian voices must finally take centre stage was with Malia Bouasha. And she was in conversation with Mohammed El Kurd in this very room, of course. Um, but of course, we're here today to be with uh, Dr. Gada Kami uh, and, um, and to talk about her latest book. Now, as you will know, she fundamentally argues that the peace process uh, has favoured the two state solution for more than 40 years. And she believes it's now been internationally exposed as masking the expansion of Israel's apartheid regime. Now, 75 years ago, uh, Garda and her family in Jerusalem were among the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who were exiled during the Nakba. And of course, last month, um, the world commemorated the Nakba. Um, many of you here were at the uh, event at uh, Westminster Central Hall um, with the Palestinian ambassador and with many others to commemorate the Nakba. Uh, Nakba, uh, uh, th th so we, uh, Garda has since become one of the most vocal proponents of the single democratic state in Palestine, Israel. And in her new book, she powerfully argues that this is the best possible settlement for the Palestinians, including the refugees. Imagining a single secular state in historic Palestine, all of whose inhabitants would enjoy the same rights. Um, Garda, as I mentioned, was born in Jerusalem, um, forced from her home during the Nakba. She later trained as a doctor of medicine at Bristol University. She established the first British Palestinian medical charity in 1972 and was an associate fellow at the Royal Institute for International Affairs. Uh, Garda has also served as vice chair of the Council for Arab British Understanding, CARBU, and was a research fellow at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and at the University of Exeter. Her previous books include the best-selling memoir, In Search of Fatima, and Return, a Palestinian memoir. And I think, um, Garda, this book, in, in, in many respects, uh, is, follows, it follows on in that train, in that mould. Um, I mean, I wonder if you could just begin. I mean, I, I mentioned your, your own story. Um, I mean, you've been, you have been battling and fighting and campaigning for all of these decades. Um, and also, I, 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 I suspect promulgating a view that has become almost as acceptable as it become uh, inevitable, because that is the primary, having sat down and read your book, it was essentially the inevitability of the one-state solution that you were arguing. But I, I'd like to just begin by asking you, you know, what, what is it that keeps you fired up and going? And, you know, here we are. This, the, the, the debate is moving onto your terrain in very many ways. But how confident are you 
that you're going to see this happening? Well, <clears throat> first of all, hello to everyone here. Um, it, it, it's a pleasure to see you all. Um, the question before the one, the last one you asked, which is what, why do I do it? Why do I keep going? Well, it's very simple. There's nothing difficult about it. Um, I want to go home. I, I want to at least end whatever life is left to me in my own homeland. And um, I deeply resent the fact that I can't do that. Um, and that strikes me as being a very basic, fundamental injustice, not difficult to understand. Um, and that's the thing that drives me all the time. Um, so there is that. Now, in terms of uh, my political activism, I should actually correct you. I haven't been battling for 75 years because, um, as people who may have read uh, In Search of Fatima uh, will know, I actually had no political awareness until the 1967 war. It really is true. Uh, I, I did not spend my childhood and, and early adult life fretting about Palestine. I very much wanted to fit into Britain, into English society, to be no different to other people. Um, and I thought I had succeeded. I actually thought I'd succeeded. People seemed to accept me. They were very nice to me. And um, I thought, very good. I am I'm really almost English. And in fact, I had, when I was at university, when I started at Bristol, I had um, a first flatmate who was a veterinary medicine uh, student. And she was terribly English. She came from Norwich and um, we were um, w one day in, in, in our flat and she was calling and I heard her say, where's that Arab gone? Um, so I s suddenly, I don't know what made me say it, I said to her, yes, you're right, I am an Arab. She said, no, you're not. You're just a dark-skinned English girl. And I, I, remember, I remember that vividly, because that's how she saw me and maybe other people saw me until 1967. And the, when that happened, there was no possibility of continuing with the fantasy that I was somehow rather English. Well, I was not, uh, because I had no friends left. The truth was, 1967, everybody was on the side of Israel, nobody was on my side. And then I thought, wait a minute, um, I'm not English, what am I? I'm Palestinian, and I always will be. And that was really the start of the road to activism, which never ceased from that time until this. Mm. And I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think today or tomorrow is the anniversary of the beginning of the 67 war. Exactly. Yes, it is. And um, I mean, we're looking at a situation now, and I wonder if you could just give us a flavour, actually, because I think this is a question often at the back of people's minds, is that we're, we're seeing that um, the big pressure has been for the two-state solution. This is the internationally accepted position of the United Nations. It's what's argued for by many governments. I mean, Mexico has just in the last few days recognised Palestine as a state. Uh, and there is a divergence, clearly, between um, your argument uh, and that of the Palestinian Authority, for instance, and I think the Palestinian ambassador here, for instance, they would all say, well, this is all very well. Um, however, um, our position is that we want this two-state solution. Uh, t tell us why you don't think that really is a serious contender anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the crux, isn't it? This is the heart of it. Uh, the two-state solution has been this mantra that people repeat over and over again. Uh, but what it is in reality, when you examine it, what, what you realize, uh, what it's all about, is A, preserving Israel, albeit in slightly smaller geographical space, but preserving Israel is very important. Uh, uh, but at the same time, being aware that the poor Palestinians have had a, ro a rough deal, so we'll give them something. 
uh, will talk about a fifth of their original homeland, uh, which is the West Bank and um, Gaza, um, and, and East Jerusalem is, is, is not part of that deal, although it should be. Anyway, it, it, it forms a fifth of the original homeland. They can, they can create their own state there. So that, everybody's happy, you know. And, and who is everybody? Uh, first of all, the Israelis, sec because they retain their um, uh, state and their, um, you know, status. Uh, uh, secondly, the, the Western world, which created Israel and doesn't want to see it um, come to an end, so that sh keeps them happy. Now, as for the Palestinians, well, they get something. So there you are, it's not a bad idea. Now, f for a start, to me, that kind of construct is totally to be rejected. It's, it's really, if you think about it, it's outrageous. You know, that the, the settler state that created itself in, in the Palestinian homeland and was maintained by Western support um, is ap apparently entitled to um, 80 percent of, of the territory of, of, of the Palestinian homeland and the original inhabitants um, are um, sort of given 20 percent. Now what is omitted even in the best variation of the two-state solution are the refugees. I'm talking about the people sitting in camps five to six million who've been in camp since 1948. Well, where are they going? Not a mention of these people. How is it acceptable to leave them, nearly six million people, rotting in uh, camps supported by the UN with no end in sight, with no promise of a future, how is that acceptable? That's also part of the two-state solution. So to me, it was a no-brainer. You couldn't accept the two-state solution if you were A, a Palestinian, B, a person who understands justice, and who doesn't like to see injustice. Now, you mentioned something very important. Of course, there is a big obstacle. I, and I don't mean Israel, I mean this consensus, this international consensus <clears throat> about the creation of something called the Palestinian state. And as people know maybe here, uh, 138 states, member states of the UN, that's a majority of member states, have recognized this thing called Palestine. Well, when you look into it, what, what is the Palestine they've recognized? They've recognized a state uh, which is to be uh, constructed, by the way, it doesn't exist now, on the territories of the 1967, the 1967 territories, some of which um, we know, uh, or a lot of which, are already taken over by Israeli settlements. Apparently, that is what is going to be the Palestinian state. Mm. So, you know, the question that has to be asked is, what, what are these UN states thinking of? What, what are they recognizing, really? Uh, and therefore, this constitutes a huge obstacle in the path of people who believe in what I believe. Mm. Because you are immediately up against in a so-called international consensus, which says you people deserve a state and here we are recognizing your state. And as you said, Mexico uh, just now, and I know that the attempts have been made to get the British government to recognize the Palestinian state. <laughs> but, 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 but so what? It, it's meaningless. Uh, but what it does is effectively put a spanner in the works of people who really want a just solution. Mm. That's the problem with it. But Garda, don't, do not uh, think that there's a difference between, let's say, the, the, the settler states of uh, Algeria or Rhodesia or, or South Africa as well, uh, with uh, Palestine, Israel, because of the demographics. The settlers were in a minority in those countries. 
Um, but where we're talking about, it, the, I mean, tell us actually, will you tell us something about the, the, the demographics? Because you mentioned all the refugees, um, and you, and also be moving from just the demographics to um, what the actual aim is of the Israeli state as we see it now. Would your, would this one state solution be possible if the desire is to make sure that there aren't enough Palestinians? in the Palestinian territories and to drive them out, which appears to be the policy. Absolutely. And that is why the, the one state idea needs all the support it can get, because Israel's trajectory is clear. Uh, anybody who can't see that uh, really needs to do a bit of reading. The trajectory is clear. It's to get the land without the people and they're working hard at it all the time. It's quite openly debated, you know, in Israel. So that's, that's the Israeli position. Uh, now, if you actually look at geography, what you see is that the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, one territory, one territory ruled by Israel, is composed demographically of roughly half and half Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. That's, never mind the refugees, that's in actual, in historic Palestine, inside historic Palestine. So it seems to me very clear that since we have a situation of one state already, there is one state. But the problem with that one state is it's ruled by one uh, apartheid regime mm. which uh, uh, deals with half the population in a manner that no civilized uh, society can accept. They have no rights, they have no, um, they have no citizenship, and yet they're ruled by this apartheid regime. So, I mean, honestly, what more logical than to look at setup like that? Never mind all the stuff that's written all the time. Look at look at the setup. Clearly, the next move from that is to alter the regime that's ruling this one territory. That's clearly the case, you know, because if you do not have um, a, a, a system of government which discriminates between Jew and non-Jew to the detriment of non-Jews, if you don't have that anymore, what you have is moving towards what I'm talking about, mm. that you're all together in one state and what government is going to and, rule And this, Garda, is, is predicated on your, I think your fundamental argument runs all the way through your book, is equal rights. Because essentially, equal rights, one person, one vote, the question, of course, I'm sure everybody would be asking in this room, how do you get there with such an obdurate uh, uh, government, with a very sizable part of the Israeli population that is incredibly hostile? I'm sure if you were sitting down with uh, liberal-minded uh, Israelis in Tel Aviv, you could reach some kind of agreement. A lot of people were demonstrating over this past weekend in commemoration for all of this. But this is a very small minority and you're up against some very, very hard-line people and with a disinterest at the very best of the West. Yeah, and of course you put your finger on why this is so very difficult to achieve. We have to be honest about it. We have to distinguish between what I am putting forward as a desirable state of affairs, desirable, and the first question needs to be, do you agree with the idea now, just set aside for a minute, how do we get there? Ah, oh, but, you know, the Israel. do you like the idea? If you do, if you do uh, agree that people cannot be ruled without rights, and those rights have to be equivalent uh, throughout the territory that is being ruled, and that just seems to me to be very obvious. Now, if people say, yes, we sign on to that, we agree to that, right, now we're up against the how, which was the how question you asked. Now here, I, I feel very strongly people have to face the face facts. It's really, it's really the case that 
if you asked Palestinian Arabs uh, today to say, now look, here we are, we're going to have, uh, we're going to change the form of government, we're going to have a government of equal rights, you become equal citizens with these Jews. <clears throat> I can bet you most Palestinians will say no thank you because they don't want to live with their usurpers, with the people who've treated them so badly, that's on the Palestinian side. If you go to Israeli Jews and you say, how do you view the idea of um, equality, equal citizenship with all these Arabs? They would be horrified because for them, Arabs, first of all, there is a, a strong racist element in all this. Uh, they are a despised people, and the last thing they would want is equal citizenship with people they despise. Furthermore, they have loads of privileges at the moment, the privileges of a col colonial society. They don't want to give up. So if you were to approach this question from how, do this, how does this side feel and that side, you have to face facts. They don't like it. They don't want it. The Palestinians would say to you, our dearest wish is to turn the clock back to a time before 1948 when this was our homeland. If you go to the Israeli Jews and say to them, what about they, their dearest wish is for the Palestinians to disappear. So that is the reality, and that's what we're dealing with. So where do we go from here? And that is actually, essentially, the question in that book. Mm. Facing facts, this is how it is. You have, on the one hand, a way forward which is moral, it's sensible, it's realistic, and it's going to work. It, it might work. On the other, you have the reality of two camps which don't like each other, and they don't want to live together. So wh what do you do? Now, if I were to give away with what, I would, what, what I'm saying, nobody will buy the book. <laughs> there you go, there you go. You're going to buy it. No, um, no. no look, we're going to open it up to all of you shortly, but I just wanted to kind of end on a, on a couple of questions, we're looking more broadly at the support um, beyond Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. And by the way, if you're going to get a one state solution, you've got to agree on the name. That's the first bit of it, and that's the, uh, that could be a bit problematic. But there's, um, you know, I was, I was looking at this, the, 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 the reality is, and, and I think probably when you were writing the book, um, this was before the great turmoil that we've seen in Israel itself in recent weeks. And we're seeing this kind of march of the theocrats in many ways. We're seeing uh, the, the, a very, very strong uh, identity with the Zionist ideology and all the rest of it. Uh, we're seeing uh, liberal values in Israel being sort of on, put on the defensive and, and essentially Israel becoming a much more uh, identifiably uh, theocratic state, which makes it more difficult, potentially, for some of its supporters to continue to support it from outside. So my first question is, is do you think that with what's been happening in Israel and also what it's been doing, what it's military, what this, uh, we're seeing the uptick, sensationally large ups, uptick in the number of people killed and murdered by, uh, by, by soldiers and what have you this year, do you, do you think that's going to, is that feeding in? We know it might be, as you talk about in your book, amongst, amongst people generally, but is it affecting government? And the second part of the question is, if for so long um, the United States was engaged in shuttle diplomacy until it gave up after Oslo, perhaps, or whatever, and really most Western governments have paid absolute lip service to the UN resolutions they've either helped write or voted for, do you think uh, Palestine, Palestinians will be increasingly looking elsewhere, perhaps to other countries, perhaps to China, for instance? Because you're not getting support. If, if you've given up on the West, why, uh, why, not, why not look elsewhere? Yeah. yeah, no, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, let me just say a word or two about the West. Um, you know, these liberal Zionists you, you mentioned, the truth is, and it's got to be faced, you know, um, the West is fixated on the idea of Israel. They can't give it up. And uh, I've often uh, speculated that one of the reasons why the one state, 
uh, idea, with all the sense that it makes, doesn't get anywhere at official level in Western circles. And no institution, no Western government has supported it or adopted it. That a very basic reason for this is the fact that they understand that if you have a one demo democratic state, that's the end of Israel, as you know it. It's not, it's not uh, Israelis being killed. It's the state structure of Israel will end. It has to in a one democratic state. And they resist that. Now, it's an area I want to explore much more. Not, obviously, we haven't time, because it's very important and very interesting. The Western adherence to the idea of Israel, which they can't give up. They, they, it's like an addict. They can't give up on it. And it makes it very difficult, really, to, to, you know, to work with them. So, so, the, the, so, so we have that to worry about. Now, you also mentioned, you gave some parallels. Look, first of all, let me tell you, uh, if I may, there are no parallels to Israel past, none. I have looked in history, I've looked at the current situation, I've looked at recent colonial history, there is no parallel to what has happened here, where you have a foreign community imposed uh, from the outside and maintained by the outside uh, and with uh, a, a sort of um, an emotional, psychological attachment to this settler uh, colony, which is quite extraordinary. Now, Algeria was not an example of settler colonialism. It was, you know, colonialism. Okay, there were these... Um, uh, Colon. Colon. It, it, indeed, indeed. But when when it ended, m a lot of French who lived in Algeria went to because they had a home country. Um, as for other other uh, states, well, you said they hadn't disappeared or they were a minority. It's not true. If you look at the United States, at Canada, at Australia, <clears throat> the indigenous people were uh, uh, demolished uh, largely, and 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 the settlers took over. So those are the sort of historical um, par examples, they're not parallels. But what we have here is something really very, very strange. And I have talked about it in the book. It's something that people should think about. Which it doesn't conform to the rules of um, political analysis in the normal sense. It doesn't. You have to put on a kind of a different hat and, and, and a different set of understandings to really get what's going on. Well, God, I mean, I think you know, in, the, in the case of the uh, South African Afrikaners, in the, in the end, they were assured that, their, that they had nowhere else to go and their future was assured in a democratic, uh, one member, one vote democracy, which is South Africa. So, you know, w with all that you're saying about the one state solution and the, the obvious, you would have thought, appeal to, to most people. Nobody's having their rights infringed. They're all getting equal rights. Nobody's being told that they must go or they can, all of this. Um, but we still have a real um, reaction to it. And I just, bit before, I, was, this, I promise you this is the last one, because I, I said that I'd raise this with you, because you were due to debate this, I believe, um, uh, with uh, Loki, this whole issue. And you were going to do an event, and suddenly it was, it was pulled because of pressure from outside. Uh, can, can, you, can you tell us, with, by the way, this is by the way we're saying, we're doing this, and they didn't. <laughs> but, but, but do tell us, Gardo, what, what is it that is so uh, incendiary about this issue of a one-state solution that had the event, I think it was with the, the Balfour project, was it, it, was, um, it was pulled? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the issue. It wasn't uh, the issue. Uh, and it wasn't me, apparently. Um, it, it was low-key. And, uh, and the reason right. was, this was the Balfour project people may or may not have heard of, but um, it, it is this charity uh, which uh, is interested, it interests itself in Palestine, <coughs> but also does have connections with uh, what you might call liberal Zionist organizations and individuals. Now, what happened on this occasion, uh, and, as, and as Mark said, this is the, the book lodge that you, you were not allowed to hear, but you're allowed this evening. 
Um, this book, this book, the book launch was, was cancelled because one of these liberal Zionist organizations objected to Loki. Loki, who is identified by some of them as, quotes, anti-Semitic. Uh, now, it, that's nonsense, he's not at all anti-Semitic, and they were never able to produce any evidence that he was. But sadly, the organizers, uh, on behalf of the Balfour Project, pulled it in fear, in case there was an offense caused to the liberal Zionists. Now, you know, this happened on the night before, before the book launch was due, literally on the night before, where this organization, this Zionist organization objected on the night before. <coughs> but unfortunately, uh, what should have happened is that the organizers should have said to the Zionist organization, it's too late, you've left it very late, we cannot cancel. Uh, these speakers, uh, maybe you know, later we will look into it, etc. Something they didn't do it. They they put, threw me under the bus, uh, and Loki was uh, persona non grata, um, uh, just because these Zionists were upset. Now you know this is exactly what, in a way, I've been talking about roundabout way. I can only put it to you this way. Until people understand really what Zionism has done to the Palestinians, until they understand what it is actually, what Zionism is, soft, not soft, liberal, not liberal, it's all Zionism. Until people understand that, they cannot claim to support Palestinians wholeheartedly. If you support Palestinians wholeheartedly, you must reject Zionism. For me, it's very clear, and that incident... In a, in a nutshell, Garda, tell us what Zion, Zionism is, because we see so many times people are attacked for being anti-Semitic if they're critical of Zionism. Yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, please tell us yes. what it is. At its, base, at, at its most basic, Zionism was a project, is an ongoing project, to create and maintain a state for Jews. And in doing so, it had to exclude, right from the beginning, non-Jews. So, and hence I was expelled. And so many others were expelled because we were non-Jews. And it's very important to understand, it's on that basis that we were non-Jews that we were expelled. So that's what Zionism continues to maintain and wants to expand the, ret the territory of the, of the state of, of the Jews um, in order to accommodate more Jews. And so you can see, in order to get more territory, you've got to clear the non-Jews out, which is more Palestinians like me. Now that is Zionism, and it's brutal, and it's been extremely cruel to, to, to us Palestinians. So if you support us, how on earth can you uh, show any sympathy towards a project like this? Thank you, Garda. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to open it up to all of you, so please uh, let us have your questions. Uh, tell us who you are, if you will, um, and you don't have to have bought the book to ask a question, but starting with you, please. Oh, okay. <coughs> oh, yes, yeah, sorry, the microphone will come around. Mm. <coughs> Don't tell me to put a mint in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, Canada, I'm a city in Lebanon, Beit Musallam. So I'm a, I'm a Canadian writer. I'm, I'm actually working mainly in Iraq now. I wrote a book called Dancing in the No-Fly Zone about pre- and post-invasion culture, working on a new one. Um, and I've been following the plight of Christian, Christians in the Middle East for a long time, including in Palestine um, and in Iraq. Um, so I have many questions, but uh, I'll just try and focus on one, which is kind of encompassing a lot of the themes that you've discussed. Um, I don't know um, what the turning point is going to be in terms of uh, Western support for Palestine and or a one-state solution, but I'm very interested in 
observing with keen interest the, um, the land grab that's happening uh, around the Mount of Olives. And also there was recently an incident, which was one of many where there was, I, I think, some sort of hapless uh, American Zionist Christians who were surrounded by um, <clears throat> extremist Jews telling them to go home. So is there going to be, do you think, a turning point in Western support for Israel if um, this land grab in the Mount of Olives uh, really hits home if this anti kind of Christian, even anti Christian Zionist stuff is, is continuing. And then my other question is who um, on the Israeli left uh, shares your views about the one state solution? Because there are many different concepts of the one state solution. So I'm familiar with like Jeff Helper's vision, et cetera. But, and who um, in Palestine um, is really uh, adamantly against your particular vision of the one state solution? It's a good question. Good question. Um, yeah, uh, look, the answer to the first bit, you know, at what point will the West turn because of land grabs and so on? The answer is at no point, because the land grabs are going on all the time and the West has done nothing, absolutely nothing. And you have to, you know, reflect for a moment that Israel only does what it does because it has complete, it does it with complete impunity. It has no, it has to be accountable to nobody. And, you know, what a fantastic position to be in. You can steal, you can do all, you can murder, nobody will hold you to account. So that, that is in reality, so the answer, I'm sorry, is at no point will that happen. Now, uh, the, 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 second, the second issue, which was, remind me, Oh, yes, 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 yes. Look, there is a small um, uh, organization which calls itself the One State, One Democratic State Campaign, <clears throat> which is composed of Israeli Palestinians and Israeli Jews. It's a small group, um, Jeff Halper includes yeah. Jeff Halper, and they are working towards the idea, very similar to mine, that you need to create a democratic state. Um, otherwise, I'm sorry to say, the Israeli left is not really helpful. Most of the Israeli left, there's, there's very few members anyway, and, and it is not helpful. Because the vision I have, I think one has to be clear, is uncompromising. I, don't, I do not accept, but what about uh, maybe they can have a bit of this, maybe they can... No, it's uncompromising. You have equality, equal rights in a democracy, one person, one vote democracy. And who on the Palestinian um, side is adamantly opposed to your vision is the other part of my question. Right? Well, there are some. There, 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 there's quite a number and it's growing. It's growing. I mean, I can tell you, I've been banging on about this um, since maybe 1990, really. And over the years, the decades, I've noticed an increase and a welcome uh, increase in the numbers of Palestinians who've signed on to this initiative, who are keen on seeing such an outcome. So it is, it is something which is growing. But as I argue in the book, it's too slow. It's all too slow. You, of course, these organizations are great and it's wonderful, but it's too slow. Something else is needed. Thank you, Garda. Um, no, you're, you've got the microphone. I was going to say, have you got a question? Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, you, sir. Jonathan Chadwick. Um, Rada, how good to see you. Um, how lovely to hear your voice and how important it is, although you've been deprived of your homeland to have you here to talk sense. And um, what I want to ask you is this. Israeli society is in a crisis which may well be a terminal kind of crisis. There are major divisions within Israel. In the banking sector and the finance sector are finding it extremely difficult to hold firm. There's a flight of capital from the country. There's, and of course, we know that there are major div divisions within the major institutions in Israeli society over the question of annexation. And this could be seen to offer 
the Palestinians an amazing, um, or it could, could be seen to lay the basis for the opportunity of, of change. Raphael Lemkin, in his work on genocide, talked about, not at that point when he, he wrote the book, and he was a man that was um, buried in New York with three other people round his grave, he l outlined an idea of the effacement of a people as genocide, which might end in mass killing, but he phased it. And Daniel Feierstein, in his work on genocide as a social practice, has pointed out that that process is a phased process, which is not necessarily determined by anything other than the need for cohesion within the perpetrator group. The need the for co I'm going to I'm asking the question and I and I will continue to say what I have to say and then Harder can um, uh, answer it. This is a, a genocidal process. Do you consider this to be a, a genocidal process? Because what we might be witnessing is a new phase in the genocidal process that is happening. And if you consider what you've said about the West and the relationship between Israel and the West in the sense that um, the Israelis, the Jewish people in Israel, have no home country. That, we, you've already said, is the West. So this genocide is our genocide, if it is a genocide. It's, it's a way of maintaining coherence of the West project. Well, we know that that project is also in difficulty. And I would ask, you, have you envisaged what the American withdrawal from Israel might be, might look like? It won't look like the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, but it, it right. might okay, have. OK, thank um, you. The question, Gala, the, can you answer the questions? Yeah, thank I mean, you. look, that's a very interesting uh, qu question, Jonathan, and it's one that really deserves uh, a, a proper discussion. Um, you see, I, I, I don't think that the Zionist enterprise in Palestine is conceived as genocidal. It's not, it's not that, uh, you, you know, um, it's that it's set out to... Uh, eliminate, uh, uh, and in terms of life, I mean, the, the Zionist project is about removing the non-Jewish presence in Palestine. Now, that removal can include uh, killing, but it's not primarily um, aimed uh, in, in, in the sense that genocide implies. However, I really have to say there is an exception to what I've just said, and that is Gaza. Because the, 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 the siege of Gaza leading to uh, malnutrition, lack of basic uh, um, provision for life, to maintain life, suggests a kind of genocidal intent. Uh, and, and that has to be kept in mind. Yes, but you know, it's, um, there, there is a, and you also initially asked about were there any, was there any hope <clears throat> from these current divisions in, in Israel, inside Israel. You know, that has been something that Palestinians have, has kept, kept them going for ages. The idea that Israeli society will implode from within and, uh, you know, and they've got all these divisions between Oriental Jews and Ashkenazi Jews. And um, you, now we have the, the, the so-called demo, demo, democracy um, um, demonstrations against an auto, autocratic Benjamin uh, Netanyahu and so on. I've always thought, in the end, these are all exaggerated. I mean, the hope from them is exaggerated for the Palestinians because when push comes to shove, they will band together precisely for the reason you said. They don't have a home country. So uh, they want to hang on to what they've got. And whether that means giving up on principles and so on, which now they are indulging in, in demos and, uh, uh, and, uh, and objections and protests, um, when it comes to it, they will band together. So I'm afraid there's no comfort there for the Palestinians. 
Can we, yes, you, sir, in the pink shirt. There's the microphone. Hi. Uh, firstly, thanks for speaking us today, to us today. It's been really interesting. My name is Jonathan Purcell, and I'm from the International Centre of Justice for Palestinians. I do public affairs and communications. My question was about the... It was in, I found it interesting that you mentioned China. I mean, obviously, in terms of the West, you know, it's slant towards Israel means that there's very little chance of it being a valid, you know, broker of this one-state solution. Do you think that China has any sincere interest in Israel or Palestine, or do you think it would use it as a pawn? Like, in terms of a democratic state, do you think there's any interest in that? And would there be an alternative third-party broker that you would suggest instead? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, it, look, first of all, the Palestinians are not in a position to uh, spurn and uh, refuse any possibility. They are open to um, where there can be support for them. Um, and that's hence the reason for the interest in Iran, which is a close neighbor and which has at least publicly espoused their cause. Uh, now, as for China, my sense of China is that it plays quite safe. China is, uh, is, is very interested in stability, what it calls stability, because it's an economic power. And so it doesn't take sides in that way. I don't think so. And what it would favor is a, a more balanced regional arrangement, hence the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which was brokered by China. That's not by chance. They want to see a more stable Middle East, which is very good for their um, economic interests. So that's really as far as it goes. I don't see the Chinese at this moment, at this point, um, taking the Palestinian side or, or the Israeli side. They, they would rather, you know, everything was sort of rather balanced, I think. Garda, the, the, the other part of the equation, the, the one state um, democracy, also, uh, you've talked about it being a secular one party, one state solution. Is, th is that also going to be a horrendously difficult thing to try and achieve uh, amongst uh, people who live in Israel, Palestine? No, because I've never, I, I don't describe it as secular. I really don't. I have nothing to say about that. Because in the democratic state I in, envision, um, the communities who live in it and who uh, practice a certain religion must be free to continue doing that. So that um, there is, and that's part of your uh, equal rights, uh, that's, part of, that's a right that you express and you live according to your faith or you speak your language, uh, all this should be uh, available. I, I mean, in a way, uh, rather like Britain today, which uh, people would criticize here, it's not a democracy, but nevertheless, they, it's constructed in a way where communities uh, are free to practice their religion, speak their language, educate their children in a particular way. That's, that's what I see. Thank you. Um, now, you over there. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rosenhead. Um, I'm in Jewish Voice for Labour, um, also in the British Committee for the Universities of Palestine, which promotes the academic boycott of Israeli academic institutions. The question I'd like to ask is to do with um, the three alternatives that we have for the possible future states of that land. There is the continuation of uh, basically a, a Jewish uh, uh, oppressive regime uh, denying rights to Palestinians on uh, the one end. In the middle we have the two-state solution in which the only viable one would be a Palestine which was a puppet state with no, no borders, no resources, that, uh, no control. Um, and the third one, which is therefore entirely more desirable, is the, the one democratic state. But to make that work, First of all, you have to achieve it, and, they, and to achieve it, you have to have a mechanism that is plausible for how it will be ruled. And it isn't, I think, as simple as just get one person, one vote. 
because to get there you need to have some kind of guarantees uh, to enable the parties to live together, as has been happening sort of in the North of Ireland and so on. So the, you, you were very careful, I think, and said that, that the rights in the one democratic state should be equivalent. You didn't say equal. And I wondered if that is in your book and you don't want to say more about it now, or whether it is in your book and you would like to say more about it now. Um, thank you for that summary. Yes, indeed, those are the choices. Yes, before us. To continue the status quo, two states, or the one democratic state, indeed. Uh, and then you're saying, uh, how will this be governed? How do you ensure um, various things do happen and don't happen? Um, now, I have not dealt really with that question. Um, uh, and I'll tell you why. It's not because it's not important. Of course it is. And it will have to happen at some point. But because the uh, difficulty of arriving at a one state is so huge, it really is so huge, that it takes up all the energies and all the ingenuity and the resources of the Palestinians to, to get there. Um, and uh, when, when, when I talk about equal rights, I really do mean equal rights. That is, whatever is allowed, if the, citizen, the citizens of that state are all alike. They are all the same in terms of rights and in terms of the rule of law. There is no distinction, whatever, between Jews or Armenians or Palestinian Arabs or any of that. Now, you might ask, which would be the, 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 the sort of next issue, OK, so you don't want to talk about how this new state would be governed and so on. Um, and you talk about the, the enormity of the obstacle uh, of creating it. Then how is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Well, I mean, I will tell you, and as I've argued in the book, it won't, in my view, it won't happen as a result of a well-ordered movement, of um, gaining international support. Um, it won't happen like that. Uh, and it also answers some of the questions that were also asked about uh, China and, and help from outside and, and, and so on. It's in the nature of oppressive regimes like the Israeli regime to have no strategy whatever to deal with dissent or protest from the colonized people, let's say, except more violence. Historically, we know very well that's all they can come up with. What was created in Palestine was really, really bad, and I, I really mean that. I'm not talking about internal Zionist reasoning or the idea that the Holocaust and the Jews deserve this and, you know, it, you know, it's the least we could do and let's help them and so on. You, if you feel badly about how a group has been treated, and may I say badly treated by you as the West, what you don't do is solve their problem at the expense of another people. And that is what I mean by something really bad happened in Palestine. If anybody else has got any more questions, we probably... Yes, you at the back, and also I think you wanted... A, could we take two or three more questions, Gala, before yeah, yeah. we finish? Sure. So, yes, the, the, the lady at the back. Thank you very much. My name is Dorina, and my question is more about uh, how we can think about the biggest allyship of Israeli people uh, and the youth um, who are born now in a homeland for them. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question is because my friends who identify as Israeli but want to dis dissociate themselves from the structure, the political structure of Israel, have decided that the biggest a uh, way of uh, showing allyship is to leave the country. Do you believe that the youth of Israel today needs to show allyship by leaving the country or um, to actually work on this one state and therefore live in the state? Yeah. 
Look, they won't leave the country. I mean, not enough of them will leave the country, certainly, uh, for, for your question to, to be a real question. Um, th they will remain, a majority will remain. And I would like very much, I wish I could see, a movement among young people saying, come on, we have to end this. Let's try and see how we can work this together. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see that. Uh, at the moment, I can't see it, and, and um, the emigration from Israel, which is taking place all the time, um, is not, it will not be enough to resolve the issue, if you like, uh, by that means. It won't. And then I think perhaps we should, because we've, we've gone over by about 10, 15 minutes, there have been so many great questions and, and answers, it falls to you to ask the last question. Rada, you've partly answered this, but I share your pessimism about any kind of external influence uh, having anything to do with the solution. Firstly, because of the reasons you mentioned, there is no will in the West. But secondly, we talk a lot about South Africa and the parallels. One has to remember that there was a referendum at the time when apartheid was being dismantled. It was a whites-only referendum, which overwhelmingly voted for the negotiations to end apartheid. We are not in that situation in Israel-Palestine, and never will be. So I share your pessimism. Uh, I think the solution is local. I think the solution is bloody. And I think we can all sit here and wax eloquent, but I doubt that there's anything that we can do to change it. Uh, and I wondered whether you saw any possibility of it being any different from that? I, that, that I thought if... If there's any possibility of it not being bloody like that. Mm. Yeah, look, I'm glad you mentioned South Africa because it's the only near parallel to, to the situation in Palestine that we face. Yes, and indeed, um, many of us are inspired by the example of South Africa and the example of the anti-apartheid movement, which I think is partly the BDS movement, which, as you know, has been, is a Palestinian initiative, um, which is evocative of the, of the anti-apartheid movement. Um, I really would like to think that I was wrong. <clears throat> Uh, I really would, because y y you can see already, you know, more than 130 Palestinians have been mm. killed by the Israelis from January. Um, it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, at the moment, uh, as I speak, a, a little toddler of, of two was shot dead by an Israeli soldier. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. One doesn't like to see more of that. But I can only say what I project would happen based on what I see, uh, uh, the forces that I see in the situation. If only, if only the somebody on the Israeli side or some group or some party, political party, were to say enough, enough, let's sit down and work out how we're going to do this, if only. I can't see it happening. I really can't. And the ruling ethos, which uh, I think somebody else pointed out uh, earlier, th this Jewish supremacy, this Jewish supremacy, which is, seems to be animating not just the ruling elite, but a lot, uh, a lot of people in Israeli society, this Jewish supremacy that's taken hold makes it very difficult. Right. Well. I think that brings us to an end. And to thank Garda very much, thank to all of you for coming this evening. If you haven't bought Garda's book, please do. Pluto Press, they're all at the back waiting to sell copies. Garda's ready to sign them. Dan says there's a bar. Um, the Frontline Club very kindly hosted us tonight, Palestine Deep, Deep Dive, with Pluto Press and the Frontline Club, a troika. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, Subscribe to Palestine Deep Dive if you don't, and keep an eye on our next events because we shall have some more. Thank you very much. Thank you.